Okay, this Hangout on Air is live. So we are, uh, today is the 2nd of December, 2015, and welcome to our help session for this week. This week we have Rick and we have Mark with us who have a, you know, Mark has a few questions, and we also had some questions submitted earlier uh, from Larry and from Tom. So let's go ahead and dive in. Mark, we're going to, I'm going to save you the, the best for last. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm say, I'll, I'll hit your questions last year. I know... Um, the others came in a little earlier. Let me just, uh, first of all, talk about the questions that Tom had. There, there are some good questions here. And in these cases, I don't, I don't uh, claim to have the ultimate answer necessarily, but I'll give you some of my impressions here. Some of them are fairly subjective. But he said the following, Tom from Santa Fe, New Mexico, really enjoying your videos, which are great help for getting a camera guy up to speed with sound. Everyone keeps saying to avoid using shotguns in a reflective room. We are shooting a documentary and cannot change the reflections in the rooms understandably. So his first question is, what supercardioid or hypercardioid mics can you recommend in the $200 to $400 category? All the recommendations I find online are for very expensive mics. I'm currently looking at the Octava MK012, Sennheiser ME64, Rode NT5, Rode NT55, and Studio Projects C4. So there's the first question, and I... I uh, <clears throat> I can speak from experience for the Rode NT5. The Rode NT5 is not a horrible mic. Um, that's not a very flattering introduction, I suppose. But uh, what I mean to say is that it's okay. Um, it really is made as an, uh, I think it was really a, originally intended as an instrument mic for mic, and, and what a lot of people that have that microphone use it for is an overhead mic for a drum kit. Um, it's a little bit of an older design. It is a little bit on the noisy side in my experience. Um, but it's not a bad mic. It actually sounds pretty de decent. It's a little bit on the bright side with the, the uh, ca capsule that it comes with. On the other hand, the capsule is removable and can be replaced with others. And I'm not sure whether Rode has ever made any replacement capsules for it, but um, a fellow in the U.S. here, I'm trying to remember his name, he has a little site he calls Octavamod. So originally what he started doing was he would take these Octava mics from Russia and he'd modify their capsules and maybe change some of their electronics to make them sound even better. So he'd take these relatively affordable mics and kind of soup them up and tune them a little bit. Um, he does have a, a replacement capsule for the Rode NT5, which I have, and uh, that actually improves the sound a fair bit, um, but it is still a little bit of a noisy mic. So I think it can be a fine choice. It is a, it's a cardioid microphone. I don't think that there is a hypercardioid or a supercardioid replacement capsule for that one. Um, but cardioid actually can work quite nicely indoors. Just the pickup pattern is not quite as tight as a supercardioid would be or a hypercardioid would be, but it also doesn't have the tail on the back of the mic, so it doesn't pick up hardly anything from the back of the mic. So it's actually um, a pretty good option. Studio Project C4, I do not have any experience with. The NT55, I also don't have personal experience with, and um, I think the NT55 is very similar from the things that I've read to the NT5, except it has, I believe it has a, um, a 10 decibel pad, so if you're recording really loud, like a guitar amp or maybe a drum kit, you can actually employ a pad. Not necessarily something you would need for video, um, but I don't know that there's any benefit to the NT55 aside from that. Again, I'm speaking from, a, from the point of view of ignorance on that one, aside from things that I've read about that mic. Um, Sennheiser ME64, ME I also do not, unfortunately, have experience with. However, the Octava MK012 is actually quite a popular mic amongst enthusiast filmmakers. And that one does come with, a, I believe, a cardioid, or maybe it's an omnidirectional and a hypercardioid capsule. Or I think there are a few different kits. In any case, if you get the one with the hypercardioid, that's a pretty popular one amongst filmmakers. The tests that I've heard with that mic sound very, very nice. Um, in fact, I think they sound very similar to the um, Audio-Technica AT4053B, which is this, the hypercardioid that I typically use. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very nice mic. The one downside I've heard, and again, this is not from personal experience, but what I've heard as feedback from other people, is that with that mic, uh, there is a fair about a bit of handling noise. So you'll have to be very careful if you're hand booming it. Um, if you're static booming it on a, you know, just a mic stand or something like that, no problem. But if you are hand booming it, it tends to be very sensitive to that. So you need to get a good shock mount to go with that. And by shock mount, I don't mean 
a typical just regular clip you put on a mic stand, but the actual suspended mount with it's usually su suspended by you know the rubber band type thing um, that sort of isolates it a little bit. So I would say, Tom, that the Octava MK012 is probably one of the better choices there. I would say the Rode NT5 is not a bad choice as well, um, but it does tend to be just a tiny bit noisy. All right, question number two. A few people online say that if you use a top-end shotgun, like a Rode NTG3 or Sennheiser 416, you can use them indoors. Um, so he just wanted my comments on that, uh, especially in light of the, the mics we just talked about in question number one. So um, you can, there, there, there's no such thing as microphone police as far as I know. I've never, no one's ever been arrested for using a shotgun microphone indoors. <laughs> and in fact, uh, a lot of times it can work okay. Um, the risk is that with the shotgun design, with the interference tube, which are the slits on the side, um, what happens is if the is as the dialogue sound reflects off the walls and comes into that interference tube, it actually can cancel out some of the dialogue. It can and essentially employ some constructive interference. So that's why I think a lot of the a lot of the audio engineers will not choose to use a shotgun mic indoors. And by indoors, I, I guess I should clarify here. On sound stages, obviously they're using them <laughs> indoors, um, but. In untreated acoustic spaces, they typically will look to use a cardioid mic of some sort instead because a cardioid is not going to have that same issue. So um, that said, um, you know, when we're working on tight budgets, I don't think there's anything that's that's terribly wrong with using a shotgun indoors, um, but just know that you do potentially carry that risk of you know, that, that constructive interference coming in the interference tube. So one thing to keep in mind, if you're going to be shooting majority outdoors and a little bit indoors, maybe it's worth it. Um, but on the other hand, if you're going to be shooting the majority indoors and just a little bit outdoors, maybe a cardioid's a better choice. And then finally, number three, <laughs> which is a, I, I thought this is a fantastic question. Should I just go with a good lavalier and forget trying to use an external mic? Well, um, this is where it becomes opinion, very much opinion, and uh, there, there are plenty of people I think would choose to go with a lavalier mic. A lavalier mic is a little bit more straightforward in some ways. You don't have to have someone operating a boom pole. You um, hook it up to the person, and if it's okay, if the mic shows in picture, that is, that it shows, and you just connect it onto the outside of their clothing, that can work great as long as they don't get too animated or fold their arms over their chest or anything of that nature. Um, or you could learn the fine art of hiding lavalier microphones. That's another option as well. And uh, that's a, I would say that is an art that I haven't mastered yet, so I'm, I'm not necessarily... <laughs> I don't typically opt for a lavalier mic as my first choice. So there are some thoughts. I think that a good lavalier could be a, a great choice, and lots of people do it. Um, I would say that most of the professional location sound mixers that I'm aware of, that I've talked to, We'll typically use a lavalier mic as a backup, not as a primary mic. So, uh, except for in cases where they don't have any other option. All right. So, thank you for those questions, Tom. I appreciate that. Those were very good. Let's move on to a couple of questions here from Larry. Uh, three questions from Larry. Question one: Can you review the Tascam DR70 for me? Uh, DR70D. All the reviews online are way too superficial. It's what I use and what I, you know, so on and so forth. So <laughs> um, the answer to that, Larry, is I probably won't be able to get my hands on that just as a matter of time. However, I do have uh, just arriving today. I don't know how many of you heard of this. Uh, Tascam, a couple of weeks ago, I think, announced the DR701D which is a new recorder they offer. It's about a $600 recorder. It's actually very similar to the 70D, except that the build quality is uh, a little bit better. Um, I think it's aimed a little bit more at the slightly higher end of the market. So, um, but it's very similar in terms of its menus and things of that nature. Um, build quality is better. It also does a couple of other things that the 70D and the other lower end micro, uh, recorders don't do. It has an HDMI input, so you could actually use this as a um, in between a camera and an HDMI recorder. So for example, if you're shooting with one of the newer Sony cameras that uh, sends an HDMI signal out, you could connect that to the Tascam 
record the sound with the TASCAM and feed all of that via an additional HDMI cable directly into, for example, an Atomos Shogun recorder. So it does that. It also has a time code clock that's a temperature compensated time code clock. So you can sync it to other devices that do time code and um, what else? I think those are the main difference. Oh, it also records a stereo mix. So it, it does a, you know, it actually, you can mix the different channels. It's a four track, rec or sorry, a six track recorder with four microphone inputs. So in any case, I will, Larry, review that, which again is very similar in terms of usage to the 70D. So look for that coming up here in the next few weeks. I just received the recorder today. It actually, I was surprised they sent it to me this early. Um, over at B&H, they say that they're starting pre-orders in January. So um, looks like an interesting little device. We'll see how that pans out. Uh, question number two. I know your class is about audio, but is it possible to talk a bit about lighting? Um, yes, it is possible to do that. <laughs> we'll do that quickly. I'd like to hear your thoughts on indoor and outdoor lighting of a single subject for an interview and what tricks and tips you might offer even a seasoned videographer. I think what we'll do probably, Larry, is we'll take that into another session. Um, I think they're all great questions and as I mentioned before, <laughs> early next year I'll probably be working on a lighting course as well. So um, we'll come back to that one. Then number three, can you talk about syncing audio versus using what's off the camera and how easy or difficult or time consuming it might be for a semi-good editor in Final Cut Pro 10? I thought you once said that using audio from a mixer card and syncing it is better than using what the camera captures even with a good mic. I think that's typically the case, yes. Um, when most recorders can record 24-bit audio, whereas most, at least consumer cameras, are only going to record 16-bit audio. Um, in and of itself, I don't know that 16 versus 24-bit makes a huge difference in terms of how the, the audio is captured. I don't want to get into all the technicalities, but I think where that becomes especially an asset, recording in 24-bit versus 16-bit becomes an asset, is if you're going to do any sort of post-processing. And if you want your audio to be loud and present um, and really sort of sit nicely relative to other programming available on the internet or broadcast or however you're distributing your video, um, you really do need to do at least some sort of standardized loudness. Uh, mastering. So, yeah, I think it's definitely better to do it, um, better to capture 24-bit so you have a little bit more latitude to, to move things around in post-production. As far as Final Cut Pro 10 is concerned, let me just show you that really quickly here. I am going to open up Final Cut here. Okay. Let me share my screen here. Okay, we are sharing Final Cut. Let me just open a project or a library here. Uh, let's see, let's get our... Uh, let's see, no, we'll take a different one. No, not that one. That's why I wasn't opening it right. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's go with the Sennheiser. Okay. Let me show you um, a couple of things. There, the ideal way uh, that's that's very quick, and then another way that's a um, if you do need to drop to a manual, it'll do it automatically. But if you need to drop to a manual process, let me just show you how to do that as well. Um, so if you had here is my video clip. Here is the corresponding uh, audio clip, and what I would do is just select both of those, right click or control click on, or we're on a Mac, Final Cut Pro is only on Mac, <laughs> synchronize clips. Um, then you, first of all, of course, you choose a name for it. I'm gonna call this one, I already have this one, so I'm gonna call this Sync 2. Um, the event that you want to put it in once you've merged the audio and the video. 
Um, there are a few different options. Automatic is the simplest, and you can, if you set it to automatic and check this box, use audio for synchronization, it'll try and figure it out and apply it itself. Now, I'm not going to do that on this clip because this clip, it won't work, only because <laughs> um, this was recorded in an extraordinarily noisy convention center, and you couldn't even hear the dialogue on the, um, from the talent there. So we're not going to do that. The, so that's the automatic way. And actually, let's, let's drop out and let me show you in a case where it would actually work. Um, off axis two and here. So I just right click, synchronize clips, give it a name. I usually like to shorten it to sync. Um, change it to automatic, check the automatic box, click OK. And it's processing here. And there's your synced clip. Now I can't play it back here. I don't have the audio routed back to the Google Hangout, but here we have the audio now synced up. Now, the one thing to consider in Final Cut Pro in particular is once you have that done, what you typically want to do is come back over here to the audio. You select the clip that you just synced, come to audio, and you want to untick storyline. You want to get rid of the audio that was captured by the camera and just use the audio that you synced to. So. Once you've done that, you can drop that down here in your timeline and you're good to go. So that's the easy way. The manual way, <laughs> um, let me just show you that as well. I'm going to get rid of this one because we don't need that. That was the one we just created. Move that to the trash. Okay. Um, so the way I would do this, and, I, and again, this is hard to illustrate here just because I don't have the audio routed to the Google Hangout that we're in, but typically what I would do is I would start playing the audio clip until I got to the frame with the clap. So I'm always doing three claps at the start of each clip, um, just as uses a sync point. I'll play through this until I get to the, let's go home, start at the very start. So there was my uh, clap, and what I do is I stop it with the space bar as soon as I hear the clap, and I back up using the left arrow, and then I forward arrow again until I hear that clap. There it is right there. Once I've heard the clap, I press the M key on the keyboard to put a marker on there. Then I come and do the exact same thing with the video clip. You can see I've got a bunch of header on this clip here. And here, there it is. So I use the visual cue in this case to identify the marker. So the clap happened right there. I press M on the keyboard to put a marker there. Then I highlight the, set, the audio clip, the video clip, right click, choose synchronize clips. And this is where I use first marker on the clip and uncheck use audio for synchronization. That's how I do it if I have to do it manually. Let me explain what circumstances you might need to do that manually. I am using a Panasonic GH4 camera in this case. And what I have found with the Panasonic GH4, for better or for worse, and for reasons I don't understand, um, it captures audio and it's actually usually a frame ahead of the video for whatever reason, so it's always out of sync. <laughs> and for that reason, I'll usually just do this manually just like that. It doesn't take terribly long. It becomes a little bit onerous if you're doing an entire, let's say a 15 minute to you know, two hour piece. You know, Obviously, if you're gonna have hundreds and hundreds of clips and um, hundreds and hundreds of audio clips, you're probably gonna want a better tool than this. this. Is This is great if you're doing something short, but a little bit tricky if you're doing something long. So in that case, you're probably gonna wanna look into something like Pluralize, which um, automates a lot of this for you. Essentially, with Pluralize, you just drop all of the clips into a window, and it figures it all out for you. And then it, you can export it as a Final Cut Pro 10 timeline or a Premiere Pro timeline. So that is the quick and dirty on how to sync audio to video in Final Cut Pro 10. All right. Good question there. And I think, Mark, was that one of your questions as well? It was. <laughs> all right. And Two for one. <laughs> yeah, that was like three weeks ago. Oh, right, that's right. Okay, there we go. So, yeah, I tried both methods, too. So. Okay, very good, very good. All right, um, so that's it. Thank you, Larry, for those. Mark, let's move on to your questions here. First, you talk about a Rode MTG2. You, you, look, you want me to ha let's, let's hand that over to you. Why don't you ask the question? Well, I was looking at the microphone and uh, you know, realized that it wasn't you know, symmetrical around it. And uh, as I was thinking back to when I had it on a boom, the boom was coming in at a 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. And I said, gee, I wonder if it makes any difference if the microphone is supposed to be parallel, not parallel, but, but aligned to the plane of the room because 
now I've got sound coming in from the top right and the bottom left, as opposed to side to side in front of the uh, in front of the actor. So I, I have no idea whether that would make a difference. I haven't taken the time to to try and do a variety of experiments, but I figured you'd have the answer. So there you go. Well, well let's try. <laughs> I I will be. 100% honest, I don't entirely, I don't know for sure. I haven't done some, any extensive testing on that. However, um, what I can say is that the interference, the slot, the slits on the side are at part of the interference tube. So the idea with the interference tube is what that allows is that allows the sound off axis to come into the mic and just, um, I don't understand all of the physics, but essentially it, it, that is what's used to, for the microphone to determine what to remove or what not to capture. So that's the sound that you don't want to capture that's coming in via the, the um, interference tube sl slits on the side. Yeah. The mic that you, or the sound you do want to capture is coming in the front of the mic through the grill and going back to the capsule, which, which typically sits at the very back of that interference tube. Um, so um, now technically whether it makes a difference how it's oriented when you're shooting, that's what I don't know for sure. I think what most of the manufacturers are aiming for is that it shouldn't make a huge difference. If you're in a very small reverberant room, that that the you know the reverb and all the other noise from the sides is going to be coming from pretty much every angle. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't. I think in that case it may not matter. I mean, technically, I guess if if you're getting more reflections from one direction versus another, maybe it makes sense to turn those slits toward where you're getting more of that. But I I think that in most cases. Um, it's going to be tough to, to kind of really make that happen in a real life situation where you're trying to do that. But I think it's worthy of a test, and I, I think it's worth uh, checking out a little bit closer. So that may be something I put on my list of to-dos, things to test, and see if I can see hear any difference. Well, I'll do that because the, the actor I'm working with, uh, she, she likes sitting at the end of the uh, kitchen island, which is a granite island. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you get I, the first time I did it, I went, oh, I, well, that's why I asked all the questions about reverb, because I was getting all this reverb. And I figured, oh, I know where it's coming. It's coming from this stupid granite island. So next time I'm going to get one of those, get one of my moving blankets and put it on the island. <laughs> that's just sort of the problem. Man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That can make a big difference. Flat, uh, hard surfaces are the usually the culprit. So another thing, of course, if you know this is a little bit more intensive and takes more work, but hanging up blankets behind the camera as well can make a pretty good, pretty good difference as well. Yeah. Um, so. right. that, that would be a real giant pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a lot of work. Um, and most of us aren't working on the type of budgets where we have that time and, and the amount, you know, the ability to put that much effort into it. So, <laughs> All right. Uh, one other question here from you again, Mark. Final Cut Pro 10. How do I export an MPG4 file for final post and then viewing on the web. Okay, let's show that as well. Now there, there are different, so for showing on the web, uh, are you asking with that, Mark, um, maybe sort of like a, how do you do a master copy versus a web copy? Right, yeah, so basically what's happening is I do the video and the audio and then I send it to the person that owns a website uh, that person has a little background music and puts a little front end onto it and some uh, uh, graphics, you know, la labeling, you know, this is Joe Smith. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and then they take it from there and then they put it on their website. Okay. And uh, so that last file I sent was a uh, ProRes 422 and it was 36 megabytes, 36 gigabytes. Yeah. And uh, so they said, you know, it's going to take 14 hours to download it off. Dropbox, can you send me a smaller file? <laughs> and I said, oh, fine. <laughs> but I, I didn't know which of the 7,000 permutation of the Final Cut Pro X I should use. Yeah, okay. Let's take a look at that. So here we are back again in Final Cut Pro 10. Whoops, we have our we have our project down here. Kind of funny how Final Cut uses funny <laughs> names for things. So we would call this typically a timeline or a sequence in Premiere. It's called a project in Final Cut, don't know why they did that, but <laughs> um, there's a share button over here on the right hand side. So typically we'll click on that. If you're doing a master file, this is probably how you got that 36 gigabyte file, I'm going to guess, is this master file option over right. here? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And so once you come into the settings here, you'll see, first of all, it's estimating this one's going to be 4.1 gigabytes. That's at 422 LT. 
if you bump it up to 422, it goes to 5.75 gigabytes. So <laughs> that's okay. typically a master file. And typically, it depends on what you're doing, but um, a lot of times, if you're, you know, a lot of clients will want something along those lines because it's going to maintain more color information. It's not nearly as compressed. It's a, it's a much less compressed format. So that's great for master. Um, however, if you're doing it for web, what I typically do is this export file option right here. And this it's is not... I'm not showing up on your video, but on the screen. Oh, it's not coming up? No, your, your, the image is static. Ah, let's see what I can do here. Thank you for that. Uh, let's find this. Okay. I'm going to share my desktop entire screen. Okay, let me know if this comes up now. If I click export file... Do oh, you I can see it now. Okay, now we're in business, yeah. Okay, very good. Okay. All right, so what I chose there, again, is... There, there are different things you can do. If you're going straight to YouTube, obviously you can use this. The thing I don't like about this is that it actually it wants to upload it directly for you. And that's great if you're cool with you know, sending it directly to your YouTube channel or whatever. But typically, I want to make some changes to it. I mean, you can do it privately first. But what I like to do is when I send out, when I, when I post a video on YouTube, I like to also send it to the social network, so to Twitter and Google Plus and all these others where it will inform everyone at the same time. So I don't typically use that. You could use that. That's one option there. Same thing for Vimeo. They've got an option for that. But typically what I use is this export file. And that sounds like what would work in your case because you're going to still send him a file. Okay. So when you do that, the format here you'll want to set to web hosting. Okay. QuickTime Movie. Multipass. Yeah. I typically do the multipass. It takes a tiny bit longer, um, but it usually gives you a higher quality encoding. Choose the resolution that you want to use here. In this case, we did 1920 by 1080. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Then I click Next. It asks me where I want to save it, and we're off to the races. So that's that's typically the format I use. Now, you'll see this is not a tiny file, but it's a little bit more reasonable. It's less than a gigabyte, and that is for a piece that is... Uh, it's not a terribly long piece. It's still only just over six minutes. So... All right. Well, my, the, the one I'm working on is half an hour, so, <clears throat> but I'll, so that, that's why I generate this gigantic file. So yeah. anyway, that's great. That's exactly what I wanted to know. Thank yep. you. So if you, if, one other thing that to, to consider here as well. Now, what they've done, and it's kind of a funny distribution model as well, but Apple broke out their compressor app into a separate $50 app. Right. Um, so <laughs> on the bright side, you only pay, you know, you pay once for Final Cut, and you don't have to pay a monthly fee anymore. On the not-so-good side, if you want to get kind of fine-grained control over the exporting, you really need to also buy that compressor app, which would let you use a choose a lower bit rate here, so you could squeeze us that into an even smaller file if you wanted to. So that's uh, that's something to keep in mind as well. I don't know how important that is for the particular projects you're working on, but that's a consideration. I'll, I'll find it when I send it to her. She tells me. You'll know soon enough. Yeah. Thank you. Good, good, okay. Thanks for the question, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, all good questions. Um, let's see. Let me take a quick look here and see if we have any other questions from the audience watching right now. Uh, no questions currently. Um, we just have a few more minutes here. Um, but what I wanted to let you know, if you didn't know already, good news. Uh, I just got it today. Um, I don't know if it actually was distributed earlier, but Adobe Audition was updated just today. And great news, um, it now has a true peak limiter built into it. If you go to the match loudness, they've actually changed the name of the tab. It used to be match volume, it's now match loudness. And you can now set your target loudness. You can give it a tolerance, so how much it can vary from that target loudness. You can also set a max true peak, which is awesome. Um, and I haven't had a chance to, to test it out. I just downloaded it before we started the session. But if you are an Adobe Audition user, they are doing a great job uh, updating this application. And I'm really pleased with what they've been doing. That is, that is huge. So that'll make things a lot easier. And it will also make it so you don't have to spend lots and lots of money 
on loudness uh, plugins from other manufacturers. So uh, there we go. That's that's the good news I wanted to share with you on that front today. All right, let's do a quick uh, round here. Mark, any other questions for you? Any other thoughts oh, or input? Okay. I've got still a million questions, but not tonight. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Rick, how are you? Anything on your end? No, well, re really appreciate the session today. Just on an audition, is this uh, still 2015 or is this the 2016 that's coming uh, out? No, oh. that's, a, that's a 2015 dot, let's see what they call it here. About audition. The 2015.1 release is what they call it. So the pattern has been recently, they generally do two main releases a year and then they'll do bug fixes in between those. So new features twice a year, usually in the spring and the, in this case, I guess the late fall. So That's great, yeah, because I know you've been talking about that for the last few months about the uh, the loudness and the, the true peak and yeah, I don't I don't have the uh, the advanced uh, Isotope with, with, with all of their plugins for 300 bucks extra just to do the loudness, and that looks like it's built into Audition. Yep, great news. Great. Yeah. Well, hey, good deal. Well, you betcha. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for attending today. Thanks for sending in all the questions. If you would like to send in questions for next week, whether you can attend or not, that would be great. I'm at uh, Curtis at LearnLightAndSound.com, and uh, you'll see the, the invite. If you, uh, if you follow over on the... Google Plus page. Um, I'll send out invites to you on Sundays for when we're going to hold the session for that coming week. And uh, of course, if you're in the course, you'll get notified via email as well. So thanks again, everyone, and we'll talk to you again next week.